please welcome to the stage, Bonin Bao. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Wow. Okay. Interesting morning so far, huh? What's up, San Diego? How are you? Are you good? Are you good? Yes. I am so, you don't understand. I am so excited to be here with you guys today. I speak uh, at a lot of places. Things like the Masonry Convention. <laughs> right? <laughs> I do speak at things like the Beer Convention, which is great as well. But I feel like I'm home. I feel like I'm with people who grew up in the same world that I grew up in. It's so interesting because it's cool now, right? Digital transformation. But I remember the days when it was like digital. <laughs> What's digital? I used to tell people, look, we would sit at the kids' table, right? Looking over at all these other traditional marketers and go, one day, one day. And I'll never forget, I'll tell a little bit about my journey, but I'll never forget how much time and effort it was. We had to measure everything. We had to prove everything. Every single thing that we did, we had to show return on. We were constantly scrutinized, constantly asked why. I'm not shifting money to digital. Nobody uses digital. It's not a thing. One day, I was offered the opportunity to now run a greater traditional budget. I'll tell you about my, my time as a running media. And I was so like, OK, huh. Finally, I'm one of these digital guys, I got the reins. I go behind the curtain, and I'm like, there's nothing here. <laughs> there literally is nothing there. The first time I bought television, it was like, uh, I don't know, 18 to 24 year olds. I was like, okay, did it work? Eh, maybe. 50%, that, mon that, uh, that everybody says, I know 50% of my marketing doesn't work, I just don't know what 50%, and that's okay, <laughs> right? But us as digital natives, us as the change agents that are driving the future of growth for organizations, don't accept that. We never accepted that, and we refuse to accept that, even though digital grows. And so I'm very excited to have been asked to speak here today, because measurement is at the cornerstone and the backbone of what we do every single day. And as I go through case studies and I talk, you'll hear me talk about numbers and delivery, and the fact that at the end of the day, growth only happens if we measure it. Today I'm gonna to talk about this idea of hackonomy. And the concept is, how do you create value by breaking things? Mario talked about process, people. Well, I'm gonna tell you to break process. Break your people. Break your organization, but most importantly, break yourselves. How do we reinvent ourselves day in and day out? Because what got us to where we are today will not get us to where we need to be tomorrow. To give you a little bit of my background, I did build two global digital agencies, and then I decided to go to the client side because I realized that clients were too stupid to buy good work. <laughs> Agency folks love that joke. So, I said, I'm gonna become a dumb client. And I went to the dumbest place I could find, Pepsi. <laughs> and at Pepsi, I ran digital marketing globally. There's no Pepsi folks in there, oh no. I still bleed blue, don't worry. Uh, so I ran digital marketing globally for PepsiCo. Again, it was like, what's this digital thing? So we had to find projects, programs that we could do to prove that digital had power. One of those we found was a program called Democracy, which was the first ever user-generated beverage. We used this thing called Facebook to create a beverage. Guess what? It became the number one selling limited time offer that PepsiCo had ever had because we allowed our fans to create it, and as a result of their participation, they bought it proving that this digital thing actually had power. We started looking at Gatorade. We said, we want to transform the culture to be digital. So we created a war room called Mission Control, the first of these war rooms, glass room in the center of the Gatorade marketing floor that had TV screens, people engaging in real time, and you could see what consumers were saying. Guess what we learned? Everybody kept saying, we have too much sugar, we have too much sugar. You know what we learned? We do have too much sugar. <laughs> <laughs> But we had too much sugar for 34-year-olds. 34-year-olds were the one, 34-plus were complaining about too much sugar. Well, guess what? They sit on the couch and drink Gatorade. This was a scientifically created beverage that was aimed at athletes that wake up every single morning at 4 a.m. and do two-a-days. So of course it's too much sugar for you. So we learned that we had to reposition the brand to the elite athlete again. 
transforming that business, creating G2, creating an entirely new product line that was a premium line aimed at the elite athlete, reversing the growth trajectory of the largest sports brand in the world from something as simple as just listening to what our customers were saying in the digital channel. So then I left there. Kraft Foods called and they said, guess what, Bonin? We want a digital guy to chart the future of media for us because we believe all media is digital. So I went over and I became chief media and e-commerce officer over some of the largest and most exciting brands in the world. Oreos, Cadbury, Wheaton, Stride, Trident, Triscuit, you name it. When I first got there, I asked my boss, I said, do you have any advice? So he said, I do. She said, don't F it up. <laughs> I said, that's sage, Yoda, thank you. <laughs> F up by not. Anyway, so <laughs> it was hard going because nobody again believed in digital. As I traveled the world, TV, 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 just buy more television. I fought, I fought, and we moved from 3% spending in digital to 32% spending in digital. As a result of that adjustment, we added $2 billion of attributable top line net revenue and 300 million to the bottom line. To put that in context, that is like adding a, 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 Oreo, a Oreo business in four years, in four years because we shifted to digital. I then took on e-commerce, which I was told, nobody will ever buy cookies online. <laughs> so great, that was the CEO, by the way. Okay, so you can see where my career trajectory is going. But we took that business from 65 million to 265 million. And it would ultimately become 50% of the total growth over the next five years of Mondelez. And we did that in 18 months. I figured I was done. I was living in China. I decided to quit because now it was time for Bonin to get rich. Well, I met a guy named Rich, <laughs> a guy named Rich Lou Dennis. Uh, a year after I quit to invest in messaging tech, I met this guy, Rich, who, uh, who was invested in by Bain. And Bain said, Bonin, you should work with Rich. Fell in love with his company, largest natural beauty business. He said, come work for me. I said, oh, I can't. I don't want to get back in the ring. He said, do it, do it. You can do it. God damn it, Bonin, you can do it. So I did it. I said, the only way I'm going to do it is if you let me turn you into a technology company. We had 1,600 SKUs, and I knew that no retailer was ever going to stock all of those. So how could I source growth from this digital channel, truly turn them into a technology company that looked like Dollar Shave Club and less like Unilever? And that's what we did. He let me do that. And in 12 months, we took it from 200 million to 300 million, and we sold it to Unilever for a little under a billion dollars. Everybody was happy, let me tell you. <laughs> the one thing, though, I realized that all these organizations, and what every single one of you do, is our job is not just to do the doing, but it is to inspire organizations to do what they didn't even think was possible. And that's what we all do. That's what I happen to have the opportunity over my career to do, and work with some of the best people on planet Earth. In fact, here's a little endorsement. So we have the great uh, Bon and Bao. Come on. If you had that video, you play that again. The great Bon and Bao, are you kidding me? I'm like, LeBron, bring it on, man. Let's keep this going. I might just show that for the rest of the presentation. <laughs> I love this. People are like, Bonin, you are so tall. <laughs> and I'm like, dude, he's sitting, but he's not even just sitting. He's in like a beach chair, like on a deep squat, like way way, way down, and I'm just barely taller than him. <laughs> I got lucky enough, they called me. A good friend of mine runs their studio. I, I got him a gig and never got a kickback yet. Still, if Jamal's out there. I need my money, Jamal. So he calls me up, and oh, he's like, hey, man, I got LeBron on the phone. I'm like, dude, you got to text somebody ahead of time. You just can't call with LeBron on the phone. They said, we want a model to transform cities. And what I didn't realize at the time was that Small businesses are under attack. 10% less small businesses will be built this year versus last year. 80% sadly fail in the first 18 months for two reasons. One, they don't have access to capital. We were lucky enough, we were deploying capital. We created a TV show. We deployed a million dollars. We built four businesses, employed 62 people, um, and revitalized the neighborhood. But the most important is that they don't know how to grow. They don't know how to use these channels to unlock growth. And that's what we taught them. We took a bagel company, a guy who had a dream of baking bagels, so he quit his job and he started in a shared kitchen. Bagels became so good that he couldn't make enough, so he had to learn how to freeze them, and they tasted almost as good frozen as they did fresh. 
And he had a dream to build a bagel store. We met him. I said, great, I want to build you that bagel store. But more importantly, the bagel market is a frozen bagel market is a $480 million market that hasn't been reinvented or rethought. How do you break into that market? How do you break that market and unlock growth? So we took him, we got him on a plane. Everybody always wants to meet with Whole Foods and Stop and Shop. You know who we took him to? We took him to Boxed. Boxed, which is like the Sam's Club online Amazon competitor. We got him a national distribution deal. He went from selling a truckload of bagels a month to a truckload of bagels a day. Truly now becoming a true competitor in the frozen bagel market. Now they have six stores in and around the Cleveland area and continue to have a thriving e-com business. And we did that with three other businesses. And I learned two things. One, the power of this channel to unlock growth at every single level. It's not just enterprise, it is all the way through. But also, that if you can do it and do something good like revitalize the neighborhood, you can wake up in the morning feeling really good about yourself. So I'm very excited about what you guys are doing with Charity Water. Scott is a very good friend, and I encourage every single one of you to donate. Um, I did write a book. It's called Text Me. It's meant to be the Freakonomics of the Mobile Generation. And it looks at the untalked about and undiscussed impact that mobile's had on every single aspect of life, from dating to religion to parenting to memory and more. And it's 100 interviews with everybody from Peter Goober, owner of the Dodgers and the Warriors, Dick Costello at the time was CEO of Twitter, number three of Facebook, Chopra, you name it. When I started this journey, I wanted to reinvent publishing. I wanted to break publishing. I wanted to hack publishing. And I wanted to find a publisher who would go on that journey with me. And I thought I found one. They said, yes, Bonin, we want to reinvent publishing. I said, amazing. After we had written the book, originally the book was supposed to be called Digilance. It's going to be this big title, Digilance. It's going to be the Malcolm Gladwell of mobile. <laughs> and I got the hair. I'm, I'm halfway. Come on, man. Anyway, so we're sitting in the coffee shop, and I'm with the researcher. And I realized we hadn't transformed publishing. All we did was write another 100-plus page book. And we had this brilliant idea, if I say so myself, to put my phone number on the cover. And I was so excited, I ran back to the publisher, like, guess what? I'm gonna put my phone number on the cover of the book and we're gonna transform publishing. They said, oh my God, guess what? Get out. <laughs> we didn't wanna transform publishing, you idiot. We just told you that, so you would use your LinkedIn profile to sell books. So I bought the book back, the rights, and today I text with over 50,000 people. It's one of the best things I've ever done. I'm gonna share some of the experiences because I think there are new channels still to be unlocked in this digital era. I'm gonna show one thing really quickly. This is a selfish plug. My dad is 92 years old. About six months ago or nine months ago, my brother started, he was a photographer for 60 years. He shot everything black and white color. He shot models, he shot abstracts, he shot New York City street scenes from the 60s on. And my brother started posting on Instagram and said, you know what? There's a lot more in the archive than we know about. I was like, okay, younger brother, I'll be the judge. So went and looked and it turns out I thought there might have been 100,000 photographs. There's a half a million photographs. And so for over the last six months, we've been archiving, digitizing. My dad comes in, and we interview him uh, two days a week. And here's a little trailer to the, uh, to the pic that's coming out. I remember when he did that shot. And there was a fire that burned down this apartment, and the only room that wasn't scorched was the studio with all the archive in it. So realistically, 20 years ago, all of this could have been decimated. This is street photography, so we've got a little bit of a mixed bag here. I have this philosophy. There are pictures happening around me all the time. And that, to me, that is the one thing the camera does. It stops time. Can I capture it at this moment? That's what's appealing about it. So, it's been amazing to have a chance to work with my brother, my 92-year-old dad, for the last six months, and I hope that many of you have a similar family experience, uh, if you can. But the reason why I show you this is for one reason. I am in a contest with my brother to see who can get the most amount of Instagram followers for my father. And so I get captive audiences, he doesn't. So I am trying to use this to win. So please follow my 92 year old dad, ladies and gentlemen, let's get me this W. So I told you I wrote a book. 
It is a live number. If you text it and you put hashtag leap, the thing that Mario got wrong, which I will show you, is that you need to put your phone number on every single slide of your presentation so that people can actually text you. So if you don't remember his, I will connect you. Uh, text me 646-759-1837. If you put hashtag leap in, I will send you a free copy of the book and hopefully begin a conversation with you guys. People always ask me, is it really you? When you text me, say, is it really you? I'll take a photo and show you it is really me. Uh, so, okay. But ladies and gentlemen, our journey today actually begins in the 1950s. If you were a marketer in the 1950s and I came into your office and I said, look, I want you to invest in this thing called television. You say, look, I want you to invest in this thing called getting out of my office. I get kicked out a lot because this thing called radio works really well for me. I don't need your stinking television. But three bold brands, P&G, Unilever, and Kraft, decided to jump in because what they saw was they saw that consumer consumption begin to eclipse where, uh, sorry, that, uh, yeah, begin to eclipse where investment was. And it's in these deltas, in these deltas, where the consumer shifts that we can find competitive advantage. And I would argue that those true change agents are those that jump into those deltas and then learn how to measure that change. And I would argue that we're seeing the same thing today, except it's with messaging. The most amount of human attention today is spent in messaging, but still less than 1% of investment actually goes into messaging which means that the boardrooms of most organizations look something like this. There's somebody at the front that says, you know what, I think we need a mobile strategy, usually the CEO. And then somebody looks up from their device very distracted and says, I'm sorry, but did you say something? <laughs> We've all been there. But what's great is it's not just an example of boardrooms, but society at large. We have become the most distracted society in human history. But what I love about humans is they'll never admit that they're distracted. They'll say, no, keep talking to me while I'm texting because I'm doing something that I call multitasking. You guys all heard it. I'm, a multi I'm good. I'm a multitasker. Well, in reality, what you are is you are a liar. <laughs> there was a study that was done by the American Psychiatric Association. They took two groups. They asked one to use their mobile phone text to multitask and perform a task. And they asked the second group to smoke marijuana and perform the same task. <laughs> this is California, so you guys are like, yeah, dude, what's wrong? Uh, <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. <laughs> there was a 10-point drop in those that used their mobile phones, texted, and tried to perform the task, 10-point drop of IQ, which was twice as much as those that smoked marijuana. So again, if you take anything away, it's that you're better off being a pothead than pretending that you can multitask. <laughs> I know the group. I know the group you guys are in. But senior leadership still asks me the same dumb question. Bonin, is it scaled? I said, okay. Did a little bit of research. It turns out there are 7 billion people on Earth, 5.1 billion own a cell phone, and only 4.2 billion own a toothbrush. <laughs> Which means two things, people. One, a billion people didn't get the text message on the importance of hygiene, and two, if you think toothbrushes are at scale, which I hope you do, and I hope you use one, clearly cell phones and messaging is as well. <laughs> then they go, because there's these new tech, they always need to ask these questions. So they go, okay, tell us about the younger generations. So I did some more research. Turns out they're doing a little bit better. 96% on a cell phone and text, 93% on a toothbrush, but only 90% use deodorant. <laughs> Gen Zs. Some of them might work for you and they smell. 10% of an entire generation smells people. Be careful out there, it's dangerous. I love this slide, it says, honk if you love Jesus, text while driving if you wanna meet him. <laughs> Even our religious institutions understand the importance of messaging, but still, it's a medium that nobody's investing in. How many people in here ever, and I'm just showing you this because when consumers change, we're so slow. How many of you in here have ever felt that their phone was vibrating with a message and they reached in their pocket, they realized it wasn't? Raise your hand. It's not just you, it's everybody. In fact, it's a disease. It's called phantom vibration syndrome, PVS. And they say people who, it's got an acronym, it's so known. People who experience it have a tactile hallucination that's vaguely similar to meth addicts. <laughs> so we're literally meth addicts. Other studies show that texting is as addictive as cocaine. So there's somebody in a dark alley going, oh my God, please, just send me a message. I'm dying over here, I'm feeding it. Please send me a message, send me a bit emoji, send me an emoji, please. And while we're strung out, 
I'm going on a mic range, I realize, sorry. And while we're struck, the, the camera guy, I think he shot me before. He's like, are you going to be running around today? Because they're like, oh, God, slow him down, slow him down. Sorry. <laughs> so while we're strung out on this thing, it's having huge impact on society, which also changes consumer experience, which is the reason why we wrote the book, because I wanted to understand how this was changing the way our consumers would experience our products, our digital products. So when we launched the book, we started out by asking people a simple question. What is the last thing you look at before you go to bed? Your partner or your cell phone? 80% said their cell phone. One guy was so mad, he said, Bona, I hate you so much. Now I have to make it a point to look at my partner before I go to bed instead of my cell phone. I'm like, you're welcome for the dating advice? I don't know. Text back, yes, I'll auto bill. How do you want, I don't even know how to. It's interesting because when you look at dating, a younger generation now actually has conversation before actually meeting a person. And it's almost in real time like we do with other messaging. And many of that younger generation said they love that because they no longer have to be afraid of rejection. I said, I grew up being rejected. It builds character. Screw these millennials. <laughs> There's kids in the audience. I got to be careful. It's also changed parenting. <laughs> What's the average age that somebody would give a kid a cell phone? People just yell out some numbers. Two, two, two. Some people are like, birth, here's YouTube. Good luck, kid. Like, <laughs> That's hard knock life right there, baby. You know, so, no, I think I heard 12 in the audience somewhere. Okay, yeah, right there, okay. You're gonna get a gift. Quantum Metric is gonna get it for you. I have no clue, good luck getting it. But anyway, just remember, I gave it to you if it's something good. So, <laughs> But what was more interesting is parents talked about the collapsing of hierarchy. So think about this. There used to be a time you're late to work, you're driving, you got this little thing next to you, tugging. What? Why is the sky blue? Because I said so. Now it's like, well, that's funny. Google has a totally different answer. <laughs> or look, little Johnny, I don't care what Bonin says. Do not smoke marijuana. Well, that's funny. Your college roommate just put photos of you doing bong hits on Facebook, and you turned out OK. We forget, just like companies, we have an entire generation that's grown up documenting their lives in these channels that now have kids. So talking about radical transparency, seeing your entire life. Or what's even more interesting is, when I went away to school, I maybe talked to my parents maybe once or twice, depending on how lucky or unlucky you are. Um, and now, kids have a continual dialogue with their parental unit. So if this was supposed to be the moment in time when you left and you became who you were going to be in life, does that transition happen anymore? Or the death of rebellion. I could tell my mom, hey, I'm going to little Johnny's house. And as long as I made it, in some reasonable amount of time, she didn't know any different. But now we have GPSs in their pocket. Carolyn Everson said, Everson said, I can't wait, number three at Facebook, I can't wait until I can get a chip in my twin daughter's head so I know where they are every second of the day. I was like, you're a crazy woman, Carolyn. And it explains the whole Russian thing. I get it now. I get it. It all locks. <laughs> and even crazier, if you think about it, the very first thing that a child sees now when they come into this world is a cell phone. 80% of newborn babies have their photo up on a social channel within the first hour of their birth. So the first thing they see is dad there with the iPhone or the Android, depends on his economic level, going, OK, hey, can you smile? <laughs> No, I can't smile. I'm being born. Can we do this later? But I also realized there's a delta. <laughs> there's a delta here. 20% don't have their photos up. We can fix this, people. So ladies and gentlemen, I give you the Nelfie, the newborn selfie. No child left behind, people. We can make birth great again. We have the tools and we have the power. We can do this together. <laughs> We've also turned pee time into me time. How many times people lie to you? Oh, I gotta go to the restroom. I know you, you just liked my photo on Instagram before you got back. What do you mean? You didn't have to go to the restroom. People told us stories about how they lie to their friends. You wanna do an experiment. The funny thing is next time you're out at dinner, wait until nobody's on their phone, they're all just talking, then pick up your phone and look, and you'll see it goes around the table. Because everybody's like, finally I can do exactly what I really wanna do is check this Instagram, see how many likes I got on my last post, this food post that I'm clicking over here. It, it's so crazy that we've taken what we, has become a societal norm, and now we have to lie to try to break that societal norm. And so it's having huge impact on who we are and how we engage as consumers. 
and ultimately as humans. But I also thought, all this time spent in stalls, there's gotta be something there. So I give you charging stations and stalls, people. Who's with me? You know you need it. It's a big, this is like Uber, guys. Don't miss out on this one. Text me, find me at the end of the day. Let's get this going. <laughs> but the thing that was become the most interesting to me, and I think as we think about consumer experiences, we think about digital products, and we think about what the next gen of those are, it's personal. And it's not just personalization, but it's actually personal. It's a one-to-one -one level. You had a great experience with Airbnb. I had a horrible experience with hotels tonight <laughs> in Miami. There are a lot of bad hotels in Miami. I just want you just a heads up. <laughs> and I found one of the worst somehow on New Year's. <laughs> But I texted with the, uh, the, the rep, and they turned it into an amazingly positive experience, very personal, talking to me about his holidays and how he's thankful for guests like us because it makes working double. It was amazing. And so I've experienced this my, on my own. I'm going to read you guys something. So here's what happens, right? People text me, just like you guys are going to do. I need to get 100% conversion in here, guys. Quantum metric is measuring, so we all know. We got your names. Hunt you down. I will find you. I'll cook you on the internet. I'm not afraid. So when it comes in, people text, and people don't know what to say, so they say things like, hey. <laughs> Profound. So I write, hey, back. I text with 50,000 people. I got time for hey. Or they write, hi. So hi. here's somebody who literally writes, hi. So I wrote, hi, back. Took you long enough. It's a bit aggressive. <laughs> We're just getting to know each other, okay. For a number, I happen to be traveling, thank you very much, but okay. For a number found in a textbook, I thought I'd get a response from a sooner. LOL, gotta put LOL so you know I'm being jovial. I wrote an entire book on texting. I think I got LOL down, but that's cool. Thanks for, thanks for helping me out there. They write, I mean, it's not a textbook, it's a marketing book. You should get an autoresponder for this. I said, yeah, didn't want to do an autoresponder because it didn't feel genuine, but did you read the book? No. <laughs> Tough customer over here. I was browsing the section where the book was and curiosity kicked in. I write, well, glad you were curious enough to text, but I must say it's a good book if you ever have a chance to read it. LOL. Bam, right back at you. Two complete this LOL game. I'm <laughs> dialed right in with you now. Okay. I'll give it a look over next time I'm in Barnes, which I guess is the abbreviation for Barnes and Nobles. I thought it was nothing because they're not going to exist, right? Anybody in here for Barnes and Nobles? Okay, sorry. <laughs> book business is tough. Trust me, I wrote one. I know. <laughs> Barnes & Nobles was no help to me. Uh, so, <laughs> I don't even know what it's about. I just thought it'd be interesting to see what happens if I text the number. So I go, it's about mobile culture, the Freakonomics of the mobile generation, looks at the undiscussed and not talked about impact that mobile's had on every aspect of life, from dating to religion to memory and more. Ha, ha, ha. Speak about dating definitely ruined my last relationship. I was a texter. He was a caller. We were doomed from the start. LOL. <laughs> so I'm like, I don't know if they really know. Maybe I should explain LOL again. I go, do tell me more. Actually, the book is interviews 120 people, decide to put my phone number on the cover so I could talk to people about how it's changing their lives. How did you guys meet? Was it on a dating app? No, we were college sweethearts. So how did the phone bring on what you seem to think was the inevitable? They write, I find that because I text so much, I have a hard time articulating myself on my feet. You can't Google the definition of a word mid-conversation to make sure you're using it correctly. You can't take too long to respond or people will perceive you as not so bright. You can't edit your words mid-conversation. My ex is a life coach, motivational speaker, soon to be author, Marine, and has the charisma of a politician. Communicating with him is a struggle for me. I even had panic attacks when I needed to communicate anything serious to him. So now I'm like, how do we get right back to LOL? Because I'm really good. I'm really good in that LOL space. This just got real deep. So <laughs> they go on. Me, I'm just your average receptionist with dreams of being an entrepreneur, but no idea of how to materialize them or where to start. So I write back, wait, sounds like you're very perceptive and self-aware. So I'm sure you're a rock star. Maybe it was not you who had a hard time communicating. Maybe he was just so used to speaking that he didn't know how to listen. Come on, guys. I just put my number on the cover of a book. I'm not a professional here, people. I'm trying my best out here. <laughs> then I write back, what's the idea? She never wrote back. So, okay, clearly not an entrepreneur. But it's amazing because I have these personal, so be careful what you ask for, Mario. I have these personal relationships, and it made me realize that we're moving into a space where 
Social was one thing, and it promised one-to-one -one communication. But reality, it just became television for all intents and purposes. And now we're craving community. We're craving unique. We're craving personal. And now the products we have to build are going to have to enter into people's lives in a totally different way. And it's really about not just being a digital change agent, but being a consumer advocate for change. And so I asked myself, where are we going to learn these skills? Well, it turns out it's not the institutions. Less than 1% of the course descriptions of the top 100 business schools even use the word mobile, emerging, or digital technology. And when you walk inside organizations, they always tell you the same thing. We want innovation. But then the moment they see innovation, they go, oh my god, is that it? Kill it. Get the innovation. Kill it. Stop out the innovation. Kill it. So where should we go? So I said, OK, let's look at some of the giants. So it turns out there are companies like Facebook, Uber, Pinterest. These guys have been able to create value much faster than some of the older companies that we all know and maybe some of us actually work at. So I said, okay, there must be something there. I began to explore it. I said, what is it? Well, it turns out it has nothing to do with the amount of time. So time has nothing to do with growth. Here's a company, Mailbox, that in four months sold for $100 million. It also has nothing to do with people. 13 people created a company called Instagram worth a billion dollars. So it has nothing to do with the number of people. It also has nothing to do with the industry. Every industry is being reinvented. You guys know it. Here's going back, MakerBot, transforming the industrial industry. It also has nothing to do with region. So there are over 100 places that look something like Silicon Valley, Silicon Alley, Silicon Lane, Silicon Beach, Silicon Forest. You're like, with all this intelligence, come up with a better name and just Silicon something. Please, people. It also has nothing to do with age. All these kids have one thing in common. They're all founders. The kid on your far left it created an app called Bustin' Jeeber. Bustin' Jeeber. You guys laugh, right? He gave a TED Talk. I'm talking to you. See where my career's at, right? Okay, here we go. It also has nothing to do with education. Peter Thiel is literally paying kids not to go to school, like not to go to college, because he thinks he can unlock greater value, and he might be right. You look at Sergey. You look at Zuckerberg. They dropped out. You look at Carp, right? Carp sold Tumblr for a billion dollars. He didn't even have a high school diploma. Now, I know what you're all saying. Look, Yahoo was desperate, and you're right, they were desperate, and it clearly didn't work out for them long term, but he still was able to create a billion dollars worth of value. So I asked myself, what is it? And I believe it's this simple thing. It is a mindset. It's not just how much data you sell to the Russians. It is literally a mindset. <laughs> it's a mindset. It literally is a mindset, the hacker way. Now, I'm using Facebook as an example. We can use a bunch of other organizations, but the reason why we chose hack is because how do you wake up every single day to challenge the current status quo? We call it hackonomy, creating value by breaking things. How do you break yourself? How do you break your organizations? And how do you break process? And how do you do that every single day, time and time and time and time again? And how do you put yourself in a framework from a mindset perspective to innovate and change? And it's, if you can do that, good things happen. Like button, 24 hours from a hackathon. Here's a company, Open Airplane. They believe they're hacking the airline industry. They want to be the Uber of airline travel. I travel all the time. And I'm never like, oh, an airplane five minutes away, great. So not all ideas will work, people. But <laughs> at least they're trying. Here's a guy named Stellog who's literally hacking his own body to challenge humanity. In his arm, he's got a 3D printed ear. In that ear, he's got a Bluetooth microphone. And so when his phone rings, he answers it by talking to the ear on his arm. Hello, hello, can you hear me now? You get it, ear, hear? No, okay, that joke doesn't work, ever. But in his mouth, he's got Bluetooth speakers, so when somebody talks, he moves his mouth as if it's somebody else's voice coming out of his mouth. Here's a guy named Hugh Hare, who's challenging humanity for maybe a better reason, maybe a more noble cause. Hugh's story is really simple. At 17, he was considered one of the top mountain climbers in the world. He got caught in a blizzard. His best friend died, and he lost both of his legs. A week after coming back with his prosthetics, his brother, realizing how much he needed to climb, took him out climbing. And as he climbed on those prosthetics, he chipped a toe. But he realized he could climb better. So he went home, and he began to hack his prosthetics until he could climb better. At that point, he was a D student. Now he's a doctorate at MIT, and he decided that he was going to set his mind from turning disability into ability. Now considered the world's first bionics. These limbs, he believed, he'll get down to $3,000. And they operate just like human limbs. You can run, you can jump. When we step down, they push back just like human limbs. What's interesting is I was speaking at a conference. He spoke after me. I realized two things. One, everything I'm saying is BS. Two, this guy's actually changing humanity. And somebody asked him a question. They said, do you ever see a time when somebody would opt to have a bionic limb over their human limb? And he said, well, let me answer it this way. If your 73-year-old arthritic arm did not operate like your 18-year-old one did, 
and there were no complications, what decision would you make? And it was a hush over the crowd like this. Because at that moment, you realize that we might become more computer than we actually are human. And this idea of the singularity where there's a rupture in the fabric of human evolution might actually come true. And what I also took away, if he can hack his prosthetics, then damn it, we can transform the way we engage with consumers. And that's what we tried to do. We tried to build a whole new model. How do you hack engagement? And we came up with some pillars. One, you got to rethink mobility. Still to this day, we treat mobile as a channel to deliver ads. But in reality, it is more than that. It is a utility as a part of our lives. And how do we create experiences that take that into consideration? Two, real time. Everybody believes that real time engagement is engaging with people on posts and Instagram. But really what it is, is creating organizations that change in real time, create new products, create new customer experiences based on data and insights and learning that they're gathering from the consumer. And I'll show how we did that in the most physical business, Oreo, creating 3D printed Oreos that actually adjust based on the consumer experience that's necessary. Monetizing media, thinking vastly different about the money that we spend. It doesn't it's not just enough to just buy media and drive consumers. Imagine if we can actually make money off the media assets that we build. Imagine if we could own television shows. Imagine if we can own paid apps. Imagine, imagine, imagine. Also, aspirations versus allocations. It's one thing to aspire to be something. It's another thing to allocate the time, effort, and resources necessary to get there. And how do we make sure that we allocate the time and the money to truly get the transformation that we want? TV versus video, some of you guys face this still. I still get the questions when we're working. We have a small consulting business. When we work with, uh, with companies, we still get the answer. Well, how do you feel about television? I don't feel any way about it. All I feel about is where's the consumer that you're trying to reach? I could care less how I reach them. The other piece is culture versus cluster. We're so focused on what the data tells us about this person. 18, sorry, uh, the cluster tells us about this person. 18 to 24-year-old moms. Great, or I guess that's too young. 24 to 36-year-old moms. Great, but now there are cultural underpinnings that we can rely on, that we can become a part of. How do we put ourselves into culture and gain exponential amount of value for the effort that we put in? And I'm gonna quickly show some examples. So it's not easy work. It starts off first by building muscle memory. I'm gonna take you way back to a time when Facebook was a new thing, right? And Nilla Wafers made the best banana cupcake that you could ever taste in your life. Well, Nilla Wafers was considered an entrepreneurial brand, which means, good luck, you have no money, be entrepreneurial, right? So, thanks for that. We decided that we were going to do nothing but focus on Facebook so that we could prove out the proof point that this digital channel could actually drive business. And we started off with five different pieces of creative. We measured and test. And the one that won was this one called Momisms. And it was, the best families are like fudge, mostly sweet with lots of nuts. We then went on and learned that if we put a female face that matched to our consumer on it, that it actually performed better. So here's one that said, good moms let you lick the beaters, great moms turn them off first. <laughs> right, right. If you want breakfast in bed, then sleep in the kitchen. Uh, you know, your kid's a royal, my kid's a royal pain. So, but with that simple piece, we were able to prove that we could drive a $140 million business with just $620,000 by nine, it's actually 9.8%. But legal always makes me, make me round down, but screw legal, I'm no longer there, so 10% people is what we were able to drive. But we built the muscle memory, and then we were able to take that. And the reason why I'm showing you this is because sometimes you got to start in smaller places to build up to bigger impact. We were able to take that, and we did this uh, thing with Colbert, and I'll come back and talk about it. A little brought to you by credit is usually it. But tonight, we have a product too important. Because tonight, it's Wheat Thins. Yeah. Wheat Thins, crunch is calling. And the call is coming from inside your mouth. Get out of there. <laughs> now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Stephen, how important could Wheat Thins be? Yeah, I used to think that way too until I received this actual memo from Wheat Thins. Detailing for my sponsorship purposes what the role of Wheat Thins is in our lives. And let me tell you something. You think you know Wheat Thins? <laughs> you. <laughs> you and the cracker you wrote in on. Okay? Now listen up. So. That goes on for seven minutes. The crazy thing is, 
He had come back, with, we had gone with two scripts, he come back, we said no to both. He called us up and said, I'm just gonna read the brand brief on air, take it or leave it. We're like, calm down, Gobert, we'll take it, okay. So he does this. This is the first time that Viacom had allowed you to do a thing called Clip and Share. So sneakily, I had bought Clip and Share alongside the Colbert. In Clip and Share, you could take 30 second pieces and you could share them on your social channels. So we had a little war room, because I wanted to prove that social and TV mixed together, finding where the consumer was could actually drive the business. So we took these two, and uh, we had this war room. People are clipping and sharing. You can imagine this thing is on fire. Seven minutes is all just as funny as that. And this thing, we're sharing, we're clipping, we're sharing, we're sharing, sharing, sharing. So two weeks later, we get back the results, and we had five times the amount of reach on social than we did on, than the projected reach was for television. So I was able to prove that these two things working in conjunction to the point where we now were able to bake it into our total planning process. We called it connections planning. And here's a piece of work that came out. There's also another story I'll tell at the end, but here's a piece of work that came out of from that planning. So starting off with something as small as a Nilla wafer post and ending up with one of the largest TV spots that we did uh, in that year. If I had to describe my parents, my dad would be like the smart one and everything. And then my papa would be, he's a funny one. It's just me and him. We kind of take it as, all right, this is, this is all we got. This is our team right here, and nothing's going to break this team up. American families have changed. Sometimes we get looks just from being a mixed family. And while they may look different, they're still as wholesome as ever. And who better to say this than the beloved brand American families grew up with? Honeymade, everyday wholesome snacks for every wholesome family. This campaign was the first time an American brand had so clearly stood up for all families. This is wholesome and the nation took notice. Honey Made featuring both interracial and gay parents in an ad for graham crackers that's been viewed more than five million times. Honey Made's hashtag, this is wholesome on fire. But unfortunately, a lot of people didn't agree with our message. We were threatened with a boycott. We were called sinful. Even the right-wing conservative group, One Million Moms, calling the ad a, quote, attempt to normalize sin. But instead of backing down, we asked two artists to take every negative tweet, comment, and post, print them out, roll them up, and turn hate into love. And the best part was all the positive messages we received. Over 10 times as many. With over 270,000 shares on social media, this simple video earned over 250 million impressions from social and PR alone. And for the week it launched, it was the most shared commercial in the world. Perhaps a chart showing Google searches for Honeymade over the last 10 years says it best. Honeymade. In less than one month, it went from a cracker people love to a brand people love. It's just graham crackers, people. It's kind of crazy, right? It's crazy. There's a, other, a really fascinating story, too, because you can imagine some leaders were like, whoa, <laughs> we're not ready for this. Uh, and the brand manager who ran it, he said, well, you know, I come from one of these non-wholesome families, and, uh, you know, I believe in this personally, but more importantly, the majority of our buyer is actually one of these non-wholesome families, as, you know, you might term it. And so as a result or you know, from a pure metric perspective, this is the right. So to the credit, we used to talk about being fearless. We were gonna create a fearless marketing organization. We were gonna do the marketing that nobody else was willing to do. And to the credit of senior leadership, they said, okay, go with it. And honey, <laughs> I mean, Graham Crackers was up 21%. Never in the history of Graham Crackers has, I mean, no matter how many gingerbread houses or whatever you play it, like it does not grow like that. So this was really about ch tackling uh, what is that, uh, you know, going from, TV, video, and, and that throughput. Uh, I'm not gonna be able to talk about every single one of the points there. I have about 15 minutes left. So I'm gonna talk about monetizing media. So this was really, I wanted to rethink our investment. I said, I think I can make 10% of our media money actually make us cold, hard cash back and sell product. People were like, no way. I said, well, look, 
How come there's a thing called Candy Crush? Candy Crush, I'm smarter than Candy Crush, but they have a billion people. I also own the largest candy company on planet Earth, Cadbury. We're, why can't we do that? And the journey began by two gum brands coming and saying, you know what, we want to build mobile games. I said, great, let me introduce you to some people who build mobile games for a living. I firmly believe that finding the best partners is what makes success. They said, hush, we don't need your advice, Bon, and we're going to use our agencies. I said, look, I love our agencies, but they don't build games. Hush, we know better. So they both spent a million dollars. One got 16,000 downloads, the other one got 25,000 downloads. I was so pissed. I said, I'm gonna find a brand marketer who's gonna partner with me. We're gonna go crush it and I'm gonna shove it in the face of the people who doubted me because that's my management style. So that's what we did. <laughs> we found we, uh, Oreo. We found a company called Pickpock out of New Zealand. And I gave them three things. I said, one, do not desecrate the Oreo because if you do, I will hunt you down in the sheep that you lay with. Two, some people have been in New Zealand a few times, it sounds like. Two, if you can get the ritual of twist, link, and duck, getting it great, but three is the most important. Make the game make me money. And that's what we did. We took $175,000. We built the game, 12 countries. It was the number one app. We got 12 million downloads by the time I left. The game is still playable today. At its peak, people were playing it for two minutes and 41 seconds. They were literally playing my ad and we sold ads in the bottom. That's how we monetize and power-ups and all the other stuff you do in games. For two minutes and 41 seconds, people were playing my ad while ads were running in it. And that's real meta, people. They were so nervous, pickpock. They were like, a competitor wants to advertise in it. We don't want, I was like, are you, take their money. Get this money. If they're stupid enough to advertise in my ad, let's get this money, people. Let's focus. So we turned this into clearly one of the, probably the largest branded games uh, ever, but also a monetizable piece of media. So I decided, okay, it wasn't big enough. So as a team, we said, what could we do? Three years before this, a guy had come to me and he said, Bonin, I want to drop a guy out of the sky with no parachute on and no wingsuit and he's going to land safely on the ground. Will you work with me to do that? I said, yes. <laughs> Bonin will work with you to do that. So I ran back to the organization. I said, here's what we're going to do. Blah, 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 blah. They said, no. Bonin will not do that. So... <laughs> I spent three years trying to get the organization, and finally we did it. I'll come back and tell the story, but we dropped the guy out of the sky, no parachute, no wingsuit, and I actually sold this. I sold this stunt to Fox. So on two hours worth of content, I actually made $9 million. That is the same exact amount of budget that Stride Gum actually had to market. So I literally made their marketing budget by creating a stunt and selling it to Fox, and people told me it couldn't be done. So here's the stunt. I get a phone call on Saturday. Uh, oh, sorry, on Wednesday, the jump is on Saturday, and the person who's running it, she's 27, she's crying because they're trying to shut us down. SAG just wanted more money. But, I'll let you listen. Uh, it's incredible, I can't wait to do it. So he doesn't know all the way until the last minute that he can actually jump without the shoe. Dangerous skydiving stunt ever performed from nearly five miles up. No parachute, no wingsuit. So he just found out that he could do the jump with no, with no sh uh, parachute. I want you guys to watch something. Though. So here's the deal. So he's jumping with his friends. He gives them oxygen. Now he's flipping over. You see how he's flipping over? Because he has to do that, because he's going to land in a net that's 100 by 100 feet. And if he lands like this, he'll snap like a taco. So at the very last minute, traveling at terminal velocity, he has to turn his back and hope that he lands. Look at where he lands. Though. Look at where he lands. Look at where he lands. Look at where he lands. Is that crazy? Watch this. This guy right here. I love this guy. He's sweating. He's not even jumping. This guy. <laughs> That's how rough it was. His mom couldn't even watch it. His mom went back to the trailer. It was insane. The crazy thing is he did 86 out of 86 test jumps. He would jump, and right before, he would pull the chute, right? And every single time, he was dead center, 50-50, dead center. The one time it matters, the one time it matters, he was 30 feet off center and 20 feet away from the worst death a human could ever have and me losing my job. So I was like, Luke, don't screw this up for both of us. I need this gig, Luke. So actually, that was the last thing I did. I was like, all right, bonding out. So. I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna skip over one piece. I'm gonna show you something where I also think that how do you hack attention? How do you take a place where attention is and bring new innovation to it? So if you look at messaging, in 1992, the first message was sent, it was Merry Christmas. If you look now, 2019, it would have been Merry Christmas with a bunch of emojis. Every single 2,000 tri uh, 2 trillion messages are sent from business to consumer with gray bubbles, black text. Nothing has changed. Here's an example for Delta. Gray bubble, black text. Imagine. You would never let your brand look like that anywhere else. Imagine if you did something as simple as just add color. Or imagine if you did something like add branding. 
Or imagine if you did something like add functionality and dy uh, dynamic logic. So here, hi, Jake, and we're creating text links where you can literally text back accept and actually change your boarding pass in text. So this is being delivered by MMS. So the future of messaging, we firmly believe that we run an investment portfolio, the largest message tech investment. This is one of our companies, Open Message. Uh, and now here's me delivering instead, giving you where your gate is when you land, or even better, I have to tell you that your flight's delayed. Imagine if I dynamically slot a deal or an offer from one of our partners in. So when you're looking at attention, it's not just where human attention is, but how can you transform that attention? Uh, I'm gonna skip some things to keep these guys on time. Uh, I apologize for that. Uh, I'm gonna close with the Oreo story. Anybody wanna hear the Oreo story? Yeah, okay. We're gonna wrap it up. Now we need a lot of energy. This is Oreo. This is the largest cookie on planet Earth. Milk's favorite cookie, by the way, if you didn't hear that before. Just want you guys to know that. So here's the deal, Oreo. So I first get to craft, and they're like, we want you to work on Oreo. And I go, no, I don't want to work on Oreo. I am not six to 12, and I do not own six to 12 year olds. You can own them, right? I say, I heard that. They own you, one of, uh, so it's something in there. So, but the crazy thing was, people don't realize Oreo was on the verge of irrelevancy. It hadn't changed its marketing in 40 years. And you know why? Because nobody got fired for doing the same thing. Twist like a dunk, twist like a dunk, just do the same thing. And that's the sad thing about organizations. Is that what we did last year? Just do that again. Maybe it'll keep working. It won't. The world has changed. So what happened here is that we had reached every six to 12 year old and we had saturated that category. And we didn't have a new product that could fit into a millennial lifestyle or a snacking lifestyle. So here we were, we were stuck. The very first meeting I walk in and guess what? Another twist like a dunk spot we're being showed. On the side of the wall, there were these print ads. and One was all white and it had a quarter of a cookie. It looked like it was swimming through milk. And it said, Jaws, 1962. I said, oh, that's interesting. No, another one next to it had a half a cookie with a boot print in it. And it said, Moon Landing, 1964. I thought that was interesting. And a week later, I'm in London. Facebook announces Timeline. It happened to be our 100 year anniversary. So I thought, wow, that's crazy. Why can't we create a timeline and use some of these print ads and leave it blank and let consumers fill it in? I thought it was such a beautiful idea. I called the agency, I tell them the idea. I go, this is gonna be big. They go, it's the worst idea ever. I was like, I pay you, you can't say that. <laughs> so I, was like, I don't need your advice. No, uh, so they said, we got a better idea. We are going to launch a Facebook post every single day for 100 days that represents what's happening in culture that day. We're gonna to respond to culture in real time and you're actually gonna be able to experience what culture is like through the eyes of an Oreo. Not gonna lie, much better idea. So I was like, okay, cool. So this launches on a Sunday, the Pride Cookie launches on a Sunday. By Monday, the media has it and they're going crazy. Oreos are gay. Oh my God, Oreo, Oreo. Tuesday morning, I get a phone call, what'd you do to Oreo? I'm like, oh God, please, we keep going. By Friday, we, got a, we actually got a, a message from Zuckerberg saying that he was so proud that we were using his platform to stand for something this profound, and it was the most liked post that they had ever had. Uh, by Friday, the trades had talked about it. This is gonna be a, one of the best marketing campaigns. But the craziest thing was every senior leader was like, I knew it was gonna be big the moment I saw it. I'm like, <laughs> not what I, not, it's not what Tuesday morning said, that's weird. Maybe, maybe I was wrong. So this is what we did. For 100 days, we did everything from Gangnam Style to Elvis and so on and so forth. Quantum, no. <laughs> Marius, <laughs> just kidding. So, but it also, more importantly, it gave us now the confidence to begin to change. And so I actually forced us to buy a Super Bowl spot. I don't remember what the Super Bowl spot is till this day. Um, and the lights went out. And four minutes later, we launched this. You can still dunk in the dark. Tweet heard around the world. People always ask, how did you do it so quick? Well, we had just spent 100 days, we actually did that in six countries, learning how to build the muscle memory. So the other piece, really, muscle memory, and how to really, truly be real time. Uh, and so we launched this dunk heard around, uh, tweet heard around the world. Um, I was also pivotal because I was at the Super Bowl and I had one job, which was to pull the plug. So I got that right, and then the team <laughs> did the creative. So, I mean, sometimes you gotta fake real time. Anyway, so, but then, we said, okay, if we're doing so good in these other channels, maybe we can reinvent our overall base marketing. And that led us to do this. Wonder if I gave an Oreo to the big bad wolf. How would the story go? Would he still go huff and pop? Or would he bring those pigs cool stuff to death? Would they not 
So very proud of the work that the team did around Wonderfield. Yeah, yeah. Really began the reinvention of Oreo, but now we had an animated asset that we could create in every single region that we wanted to. We had a song where we could get different artists to sing the song, create new songs, and we also now had the dee 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 dee. So we had a, 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 a you know a voice moniker now again, and really a platform that could aim at millennials and that could go after targeting all types of different snacking occasions. And this ultimately drove to uh, overall 12% growth globally of Oreo over the, the two and a half years that I saw, uh, or that I was there. Uh, but it also led us to now want to do even more. So we launched a thing, which is the first ever 3D printed Oreo. I'm going to, oh, is there no video? Oh, sorry. OK, I thought there was a video, but that's my fault. All right. Wah, wah. No, okay, so first ever 3D printed Oreo. So, uh, so basically what we did was we said, okay, if we allowed you to see culture through the eyes of an Oreo, imagine if you could taste it. So you could literally come up and you could taste what was trending on Twitter. We were printing Oreo cookies based on what was trending on social. And so you could taste Grumpy Cat, for example. And it's interesting because right, it's really difficult, it turns out, to turn... Uh, atoms, uh, sorry, bits into atoms is really difficult. We had to create our own snacking markup language. Uh, we had to create 3D printed vending machines that printed based on what was trending. We had to decide what does negative uh, sentiment taste like? What does positive sentiment taste like? Uh, and we were able to create uh, the first ever 3D printed Oreo. People waited online for two and a half minutes. Two, uh, sorry, two and a half minutes, two and a half hours. Wait online for two and a half hours to get one Oreo cookie that they were able to actually, they could go up to the vending machine, it was a touch screen and you could adjust it up and down. And what it made me realize was that here was a world where we could create personal experiences and people were so invested in the brand that they, were willing, that they wanted to be able to personalize their experience with this brand. The head of supply chain happened to be at South by Southwest when we debuted this. And he said, Bonin, we now have to do this at scale. I said, oh, because I knew it meant I had to take on e-commerce, which is what we did and we created the first ever personalized Oreo. So you could choose from multiple designs, you could shift those designs around, you could write every, you could choose joy, glow, snow, love, uh, you could color in every single aspect, you could stretch the image, so literally you could personalize the Oreo. Um, it was really hard work. <laughs> we built our own factory, in fact, we had two months, two months in order for us to hit Christmas. And we were in a room, and this, I'm sure, happens to all of you. And there's 70 people in the room. And everybody is saying why it can't be done. It can't be done. We don't have enough time. We don't have the skill set. We're not smart enough. And the head of supply chain slammed his hand on the table. And he said, anybody who doesn't believe that we can do it, leave now. Everybody left. <laughs> <laughs> Except for seven people. <laughs> and... So like one guy was the head of procurement for sugar. So it wasn't the A team that we had still left in the room, people. So, no, we took this team. <laughs> we used to be owned by Philip Morris, and so there was these conference rooms that we never used that still smelled like smoke. So we took this little team and we stuck them in there. We're like, just don't die. Sometimes you gotta hide teams away, and you have to keep them away from the organization. I also like short timelines, because it means you have no time to think, you just have to act. And they were able to create a factory in Milwaukee that employed 70 people. They created all the technology from the app where you could color it in, you could stretch it, to overwrap technology that we built with Hewlett Packard that had never been done, so we could print in real time and then add it to our lines. And then on top of that, we created the shipper and all the shipping technology. It, it was so crazy that we couldn't even, we set up a, um, you know, uh, e-com site, and we didn't even know how to take credit cards. So I tied it to my bank account. Never do that. CFOs do not like that. <laughs> I learned that the hard way. <laughs> that is not a, you do not get pluses with them for that. So, but we had to break every rule, but we got it out. Uh, and it's nuts because we were selling one pack for 5X what we would sell a regular Oreo. And everybody told me it was going to fail. <laughs> they were right. It was a failure. We got CAC wrong. We got shipping wrong. But then when we got to Brazil it began to take off. And by the time it got to China, it was a rocket ship. But more importantly, it began to build, well, I'm gonna, it began to build um, the muscle memory for what would become our new e-com journey. Before I close with that e-com journey, I thought what else was interesting is that you could write where it says happy holidays, you could write anything you wanted in there. So people wrote everything from like, will you marry me? To it's a boy. 
I was like, don't deliver that to the wrong person. What do you mean it's a boy? I didn't even know we were trying. <laughs> but we delivered wonder and joy to people in a way that they had never had before with the cookie that they loved. But more importantly, we began our journey towards our billion dollar goal in e-commerce and personalization was proven to be a true pillar and strategy. And all that digital change and all that work and all that pushing the organization was now gonna prove that it was gonna drive 50% of the total growth for the largest snack food company in the world, $39 billion business, and also drive the growth of the largest cookie on planet Earth. And so what I love about this is that the journey started with a Facebook post and it ended with true digital transformation for an organization. And so if I leave you with anything, it's that every single one of you can hack your way towards changing the future. You can text me and here you go, look, Alan Kay says that the best way to predict the future is to invent it, but Bon and Bao says the best way to predict the future is to hack it. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Yeah.